I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. If you would please note that we do have a screen with a QR code up. If you would please take your cameras and um, navigate that QR code, you will be able to do the training sign-in. You'll be able to take a survey at the end of our webinar, and you'll also be able to print off a certificate. So if you would please do that while we're waiting here for just a minute for everyone to come on in and everyone that joins us on our Facebook Live. In our webinar chat, I have posted the links to um, the facilitated IEP training sign-in, the training survey, and the certificate. And you will also be able to access um, some information like the staff in our area and um, how to reach us. Same thing on our Zoom, or excuse me, on our Facebook Live. You'll find that information above our heads. And please, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put those in the chat box or in our question and answer box. And for those that are on our Facebook Live, please feel free to put those in the chat box as well. And I am going to monitor that. But as of right now, welcome everyone again. And please use our QR code for that training sign-in, that training survey, and the certificate. I would like to introduce myself. I am Jill Summerlot, the webinar coordinator with InSource. And I am my co-host today is Lisa Paddock, and she will be introducing our special speaker today. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at our webinar today. My name is Lisa Paddock. I'm one of the assistant directors at InSource, and today we have Dr. Angie McKinney with us. And Dr. McKinney was a school psychologist. Now she um, is one of the facilitators at the Indiana IEP Technical Assistance Center. And today we are so happy she is going to speak to us about um, part of a more informal dispute process, the facilitated IEP. And so we are very excited to find out about what it is and when you might want to consider it and the parts to it. So at this point, um, Welcome, Dr. McKinney. I will stop sharing my screen. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer or chat box, and we will be monitoring that. And Dr. McKinney will be answering questions along the way. We want to make sure that um, we're not discussing child, uh, uh, child specific information, uh, confidential information, but she'll be glad to answer general questions. So thank you, Dr. McKinney, and thank you, Jill. And thanks, Jill and Lisa, for having me. I always appreciate the chance to get to talk to parents and, and those who support parents, because I think that's where we can make a huge difference. I spend a lot of my time with the IEP Technical Assistance Center training schools, but I think when we, when we don't train everyone on some of the things that can be really beneficial to having good meetings and to supporting students, then we're missing a piece of that. And I think everybody should be included in, in um, what makes for a good meeting. Um, so like Lisa said, my background is initially as a school psychologist. And then I also spent several years as an assistant director of special education. And boy, did I learn a lot. <laughs> I learned that I don't want to do that job because it's really, really hard. But I also learned um, that there are different things that can make a meeting go really well. And there are things that tend to get in the way and tend to kind of muddy things up and stand in the way of everybody doing what is right for that student. So um, just kind of uh, a little bit of background, facilitated IEP. I've been trained in um, facilitating IEP meetings. Oh my goodness, I can't even tell you how many years. There was, a, there was a long period of time where there was a project in Indiana that was focused on um, training not only people from schools, but also parents and parent volunteers on how to um, facilitate these meetings. And I attended way back then. And kind of what I found was, it just taught me how to run a good meeting. 
it didn't really create an opportunity for me to be a facilitator within my own district or or the special ed cooperative where I, where I worked because I was still part of the system, right? And so one of the, the important pieces about facilitating is that you've got somebody who is removed from the system that is not there on behalf of the parent and not there on behalf of the school. We're there on behalf of the process of the meeting and just coming in neutral. Because I really, when I go into a meeting, I don't have any stake in the outcome. I mean, I hope it's positive, but as far as whether we add this goal or add this service or decide on this placement, none of that is relevant to me. And so it's easier for me to kind of remain neutral. So in Indiana, um, facilitated IEP services are strictly an optional kind of way to informally um, make some progress when there are some some problems within the meeting or some disagreements that are happening, um, but it is nowhere in Indiana law. And so a few years back, I, I'm not even sure how many years at this point, probably, I don't know, probably eight or nine years ago that both um, the Indiana Council for Administrators and Special Education, and I think InSource as well, had kind of asked the Department of Education, could you get this up and running again? And so it, it made sense for our office to get some people fully trained so that we could be those outside people and we could come into schools when schools and parents wanted us to, to be able to help with that process. And so now we've been doing it for a number of years. I really enjoy the meetings. They are certainly not the easiest meetings, but they're easier when a facilitator is there, usually, <laughs> hopefully, from what we understand. So here's what I'm hoping to cover in this session. But again, if you have questions, please um, put them put them in the chat or the Q&A um, at any time because I, I really feel like questions kind of need to occur um, naturally throughout the information. So here's what I'm hoping to cover is just um, to give you all a, a better understanding of what a facilitated IEP service is and what it's not as well. Um, show you exactly how you can request this because there are a couple of steps, but it's not really difficult. It just, you have to make sure all the steps are done. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of information that we've kind of learned about um, things that work and things that don't work. Um, and then some tips for those of you who are the, the liaisons from InSource, just some tips about how you can um, support your families and the process when you have a facilitator there, which honestly isn't that much different than what you would do at a normal meeting, because this it is an IEP meeting, just like any other meeting. So just to, again, a little bit about um, the IEP Technical Assistance Center. Um, we go to any school in Indiana that asks for help, basically, as long as we've got the manpower to do it. Um, we are a free service out there for schools um, to be able to give them some training, develop resources for them, provide technical assistance. We have a lot of meetings with schools um, talking about some of their trends and their data and how they can make changes when they need to. Um, but we also then provide facilitators, facilitators for those IEP meetings. Now, I think there are still a number of folks around the state who have had good quality training in facilitated IEP that are available um, for hire to be a facilitator, but they, they would have to be paid for by somebody else. So anytime that we do something um, related to facilitation, travel, mileage, any of that kind of stuff is, none of that is at any cost um, to schools or families. So what is this all about? Well, when we tr kind of broke apart all of the things that a facilitated IEP is trying to accomplish um, and things that a good IEP team is trying to accomplish, it, it really breaks down into these different areas. Um, number one, it's about building good communication. Sometimes communication is the big breakdown in meetings. Um, 
working together. Just because you throw a group of people around a table does not make them collaborative. No matter how many times we like to use that word, collaboration means that we are working towards a common goal and we, we are adding to the picture as opposed to breaking off into groups. You know, it's really important that we're working together um, and creating a lifelong team. So for, for many of you, you've had a child or a student that you've worked with that services are going to be needed from the minute we identify a student, whether that's before they ever get into preschool or whether that's somewhere in the middle of elementary or even sometimes we identify students that are in need of support, not until you know later on in high school. But when it starts, it usually to some degree goes on throughout their school career, which means that if we don't build a solid team with a good relationship right from the beginning, it's gonna be years of struggle. And I, that's hard on everyone. Um, and ultimately it's hardest on the student. Um, students don't wanna be caught in, in knowing that they've got people that are supposed to be part of their team that can't work together. So creating that teamwork, building those relationships is really important. Um, sometimes we use facilitated IEPs after things have gone bad. <laughs> and other times we um, anticipate that things are really challenging. And so we use a facilitated IEP as a preventative tool to say, okay, this, this situation is gonna be really complicated let's have a facilitator come in. When we have a facilitator, the facilitator is really involved in managing the process of the meeting, not the content, because the content, the people around the table know the student, know the data, know the situation, and I don't when I come in to facilitate. And so if I can focus on the process and take that burden off of the team members that are there, then they can really focus on the, the student and making sure that we are developing an individualized education program that is truly tailored for that particular student. Um, it's a lot of it is about problem solving and, and when things come up, having some tools to help get us through that and to help push through um, some of those some of those headbutts, some of the barriers, some of the disagreements, um, different opinions. Um, and so we kind of problem solve our way through those. And it is also about making sure that we are always staying focused on the student. I absolutely hate it when I go to a meeting and we start talking about the right stuff and then suddenly we're discussing the ball game that happened and I, I don't know, there are just so many things that easily take us off track. So we always have to focus on the student. Another thing that I think can really um, sometimes get us off the student path is when we just start rehashing old grievances, you know, when we want to talk about, you know, the person that that really irritated me last year. And it, it, again, it takes away from the process. So as a facilitator, my job would be, let's get us back on track. Let's get us back to talking about the student. So our team, as we first started really working on what do we want this to look like? We got training from an outside source, but we also took a look at all of our collective experience um, for good and bad meetings and kind of boiled down what are the biggest things that tend to derail an IEP meeting. Communication issues, obviously. <laughs> and whether it's that I can't get my message across or I'm not being allowed to share my information or communication being um, disrespectful communication or, you know, my my input is not valued um, and that a lot of different things around communication or the communication in inviting me to the meeting. Things aren't clear, things processes aren't being followed. Um, differences of opinion, um, we know that those are gonna occur and they should occur. 
If they didn't, there would be no reason for a team to come and meet on a student if we just knew what an IEP should be and we were all in agreement. Having those differences of opinion actually usually lead us to making a good decision that's data, data informed. Um, power struggles. So for those of you who are in a parent role, parents get the worst end of this, right? Meetings are kind of set up in a way that makes parents feel like they have less power or input or control in those meetings. Uh, I work with schools a lot on how to try and tip the scales back so that everybody around the table has got an equal amount of voice and power. Um, parents, you're the first teacher. You are, you are your child's primary teacher. And the input is absolutely something that somebody from school can't be part of that piece. I mean, they, they really, they don't have that same lens um, for a student. So we'll talk about some of these things too, as it relates to um, facilitated IEP. Preparation can definitely be an issue. Things just not being ready, data not being collected, uh, the room not being ready for you, all of those kinds of things. Um, clarity and transparency, I think, kind of go hand in hand. It, if it's there, we need to say it. If it's typed in the IEP, I need to be able to understand what it means and you should interpret it the same way, otherwise it's not written clearly. Um, you know, I think there should never be those hidden agendas. It all needs to be above board. And then respect and emotions sometimes go together and sometimes don't. Respect, you know, we need to use good communication skills and we'll talk about what a facilitator does that helps to um, make that happen. Um, but the emotional piece, some of that's very natural. Um, I, I do not have a child with a disability. I have a very average, she's now an adult, but I mean, she was just always an average kid, not above average, not below average, just very average. Never had a lot of problems in school. But I tell you, the second I walked into the door, even for a parent-teacher conference that I knew was going to be a good, you know, a good conversation with no issues, my hands would sweat, my voice would tremble, I would forget everything that I wanted to say or communicate. I mean, all of those things that I experienced get magnified when you're talking about a student that you have to advocate for them. You have to be their voice. You have to make sure that they're getting what they're entitled to as part of those special rights that come along with being a child with a disability. Okay, so let's get into what this looks like. Uh, with a facilitator, um, again, it's a, a neutral person. I, they need to be trained. So not everybody can be a, a facilitator. Some people can help a conference, absolutely. Um, but having good training, everybody on our team has, um, has been mentored and trained and they have to be impartial. That's a little difficult sometimes because I have opinions. Even as teams are, are developing an IEP, I know I have an opinion. I just have to keep my opinion out of it 99% of the time. Oh, the 1% where I do step in and try to ask some questions that might guide a team in the right direction, it's if I feel like a team is following a path that is not Article 7 compliant. But I like to keep that transparent too and say, I'm not sure if the law is, is written that way. Can we maybe take a break? and go back and, and consult Article 7. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, we always use an agenda and ground rules. So um, our team all have like big poster size laminated sheets with an agenda and with a set of ground rules. Now, what we do is present those to the team and get agreement on those. My agenda is very um, bare bones, right? Um, so we start with welcome and introductions, um, ground rules, so the, the two beginning pieces, present levels of academic and functional performance, goals, services and provisions, 
and wrap up. Now you all know from attending probably lots of IEP meetings in the past that there are so many pieces and parts within each of those, but they're all kind of chunked into those areas. Now, if I'm meeting with a group and they have a particular issue that has been problematic, so maybe they have just been um, debating among the group about the accommodations for the student. Well, I don't have that on my agenda, but what I will do is put on my agenda in the location about where it's going to occur, because that's what the agenda is so helpful to see, is we're gonna follow the agenda in order, because it's always important to know where a student starts from before we set goals, and now once we've set goals, we determine the services that are needed to help them reach those goals, but it needs to go in that order. And so if we start jumping ahead, I then can use the agenda to say, okay, you're down here and we will get there. I promise we will get there, but right now we're up here. So we've got to refocus and get back to whatever piece and part of the meeting that we're in. But by having this, um, presented and agreed upon by everybody to begin with, I honestly have never had somebody get offended by me shutting down that piece of the conversation and showing them where we are in the process. Usually everyone is just great about saying, okay, I, as long as we're going to get there, that's the big concern. And I think it's the concern for everyone around the table, not it's, it's not parents that often take me off track on an agenda. It's usually somebody within the school. And I'll tell you why. It's, it's not about not wanting to follow the process. It's because most people who are sitting around that table want to solve problems. And so when we start discussing um, a need that a student has, we start jumping to solutions. And we're not there yet most of the time, but they're, they're just so... Um, invested in, oh, I know a fix for that. I know a support for that, that they want to jump ahead to services, accommodations, provisions, any of those sorts of things. But an agenda will help me kind of pull that back together. Um, as far as ground rules, very similar. We present just some really good um, basic meeting rules that tend to work for pretty much any kind of meeting. Things like, um, you know, listen, to listen to each other, um, ask questions if you have them, share information if you have it, share information openly, um, no side conversations. Um, I, I'm escaping, the, the others are escaping my head right now, but I mean, really some basic um, ground rules. But again, I present these and then ask everyone in the room, are you okay with following these? Meaning, am Am I okay to enforce these? And that gives me that permission to be able to do that. And I just rarely have anybody get offended by me having to enforce a rule. And most of the time I don't even have to enforce them because they're visual and we've all discussed them. So they're just really good reminders. And I encourage schools, even when you do not have a facilitator present, use ground rules, use an agenda. They will be good tools um, to keep your meetings um, on track and focused on the student. Um, then we also have some just some different techniques that we use um, when we hit those snags, when we are disagreeing or have different opinions, or when we have different options. And as a group, we haven't even, you know, we haven't really taken a side on any of these things. We just need to do some good examination of some different options. Um, so it, it depends on, um, on the particular needs of that case conference committee, what techniques we might use um, just as issues come up or different situations come up. It really encourages that active listening because we are talking one at a time as much as possible. It's really hard to make adults do that, but they can do it. Um, but it, I mean, by having those ground rules, it, it encourages people to, to listen to what's going on. Um, I am charting information during, and any of our other team members do the same. We bring lots of sticky flip charts that we put all over the walls. Our flip charts get shredded at the end of the meeting. 
but any of that key information can be put in IEP notes or can be put as content in the IEP if it's appropriate. So I like to capture concerns. I like to capture um, agreements when we've all come to an agreement on something or key information that's put up there. And I think for a lot of people, it's number one, a, a validation, right? Somebody heard me and they thought this was important information and they wrote it down. That's an important piece right there. Just feeling like my input is important. Whether it's agreed on or not doesn't, I mean, that's a whole different issue, but just having it up there and having it visual. It's also another opportunity for clarification because I have written some things up and then looked back to the person and said, did I capture that right? And they've said, not quite. And so they've made corrections. And I think for, for some of you, you probably experienced an IEP meeting where what you thought was going into some notes came out a little differently when you got a copy of the IEP and the wording was different. And if the wording is different, then the meaning could be different or the interpretation could be different. So any opportunity that we have to clarify that information along the way before you're getting that finalized copy of an IEP and going, oh, this isn't right. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not happy with the way this was written. So I think those are, those are a good um, piece too. Um, I like to make sure that we get lots of input. So even on present levels, a lot of times you'll have teachers and therapists and people like that who share present level information. But I like to, anybody who hasn't spoken, I like to go to them. Do you have anything to add to present levels? I always like to go to parents and say, do you have anything to add from home that's different or that, you know, that would add more to this picture? Everybody should be given an opportunity to give input into the different parts of the IEP, not just their little piece that they are kind of claiming. Um, you know, parent input is not just in parent concerns. Parent input is throughout the IEP meeting. Teacher input is not just in present levels. It is throughout the IEP meeting. All of those kinds of things are important. Um, by having somebody who is not part of the content and just managing that, that meeting process, it really does help to keep the meeting um, focused on the student. When we get off track, I don't hesitate to say, I think we somehow have, have gone off the rails here. Let's, let's go back to where we were and let's talk only about student A, you know. Um, we can use the FIEP process again as a preventative kind of thing. Now, most of the time, I don't know that I would recommend this for initial evaluation and case conference meetings, um, but you could, we have done that. It's just that most of the time things are, are um, I think teams really would rather have a chance to create that re relationship and try to do what they think is right the first time and then if things don't go well, you can always ask for another meeting and ask for that to be facilitated. Um, again, it, it is a free service um, at no cost to the parent or the school, and it is a voluntary service. It does have to be agreed upon by both parties or we can't come in. Um, and again, it's not part of Article 7. It's not part of our special ed law. Um, but we do allow this within the state. And sometimes you will even see this as part of a resolution to a complaint or to a due process. Some of our uh, complaint, invest not complaint investigators or um, independent hearing officers may um, recommend a facilitator as part of the next meeting. Just, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to come away from after, after a complaint has been filed or a hearing has been held, there are some hard feelings sometimes. And trying to manage that part of the, the human element of this meeting um, can be something that a facilitator could help with. So facilitators, when they come in, again, they're facilitating discussion um, and they help to keep that meeting focused. 
Um, I try to, anytime that we're on the same page, I try to point that out, identify the agreements that we do have, because sometimes we disagree about a lot, but the things that we do agree on are really important. Um, and we remain as, as neutral as we possibly can. I, I, I don't think we're perfect, but um, I, I don't like to know very much about a case before even going to a facilitated IEP because I don't wanna form a, an opinion ahead of time. Um, what we don't do is be on one side or the other, um, give advice, when it comes to the law. Now I will provide again, clarification if someone asks, well, what does article seven say about this? Then I can share information. Um, there are times when I have facilitated an IEP meeting and I don't think the IEP is very good. But if the people who are on this case conference committee, including the parents, all feel like they have developed what is a free appropriate public education for the student, then I don't, I don't interfere with that. I mean, sometimes I listen to a goal that's developed and think, oh, that's terrible. But again, I'm not going to stop that meeting and say, oh, that's, that's not good. What I might do, though, is ask some questions during that development of, you know, what, what is the skill you're trying to increase? How are we going to measure that? Do you all feel like this is measurable? I may ask some questions that kind of guide the process a little bit, but I'm not going to tell somebody, nope, that's a terrible goal. Let's go back and, and try something different. So some of the benefits that, that we see of those um, facilitated IEP meetings um, First of all, it, it's about building those relationships. And I, I think we really do see some good, strong relationships that can come out of the meetings. Um, I, we've been in several meetings, I, and I know I've heard my colleagues say this um, as well, where we've walked out of a meeting thinking, oh my gosh, that was painful, that was terrible. But had both the school and the parent report back to us that this was the best meeting we've ever had. And so I, I take that as improvement. And I think anytime that our relationships get just a little bit stronger, even if they're not perfect yet, even if it, it isn't the best thing that we've ever seen, if it's better than it was, that's what we're looking for. Um, because then the, there's the opportunity to keep making progress in what those relationships look like. Again, it keeps the conference focused on the student and not on the other stuff. Um, you know, we sometimes will use a parking lot during a meeting and um, some people like that and some people don't. But what I, what I do with a parking lot is put things on this chart that are important that somebody has brought up, whether it's somebody at school or, or the parent, that are important and we need to take note of them and we need to not lose sight of this. And at some point it's got to be addressed but not by this team, because sometimes things get brought up during a case conference that are not really part of the IEP process. They're very important, but they're not part of the process. For example, um, if you as a parent have gotten five notices on this overdue library book, and you know that, that your child has turned in that library book, that's important to you, but it's not important to the rest of this team. <laughs> so, Again, by writing things down and putting them on a parking lot, we're acknowledging that yes, it's important. I'm writing it down so we don't lose sight of it, trying to validate your concern, but I'm saying we're not gonna address this as part of this team because you don't need seven, eight people sitting around to problem solve something that is not relevant to the individualized educational program. Um, I think sometimes too, we feel like by demonstrating some of the questioning and using those different tools like an agenda and ground rules that were modeling some good communication. Um, I, I can think back to a case that I facilitated quite a number of years ago and the, the student actually moved and after, after having a facilitated IEP in one district, the student moved somewhere else. We had a facilitated IEP when the student moved. The student came back to the original district and when they moved in there, um, I got a message saying, I don't think we need a facilitator because 
we're using all those things that you taught us when you were here. And that's what we really want. I mean, we want um, those good practices to be happening all the time for every student when we have IEP meetings. Uh, again, we're identifying agreements, and when we do have disagreements, the first big step is to identify what those disagreements are. Sometimes it's it's not real clear why we're arguing. We just know we're arguing about something, and we we feel like we're not on the same page. But I can tell you that sometimes through the questioning, we find out that People might even be saying the exact same thing. They're just saying it with different words and in a different tone and from a different lens, but they want the exact same thing. And so if we can help to kind of identify these things, again, it's about figuring out where we do agree. And then when we don't agree, exactly why don't we agree and what can we do to, to help resolve that? And I feel like with the with the visuals that we have and really trying to um, make sure that the documentation is as um, thorough and, and clear as possible, it, it really does support um, follow through on some of those actions because we're writing them down. Like we talk about a lot of things during a meeting. I know when we have a staff meeting, if, if we didn't have somebody taking notes and writing things down, I would completely forget half the stuff that I was supposed to do. So I think it's really important to make sure that, that we have all those things documented as well as possible. And um, I've had a few meetings where we've actually created an action plan as well, because there were some follow-up actions that had to happen in order for this IEP to be put in place and to make sure that it was going to happen within a, a short amount of time, because we always have to implement those um, IEPs fairly quickly after we get all the notice out. So here's what I would suggest is when you start looking at your situation, obviously we can't facilitate every IEP meeting that happens in the state of Indiana and they don't need us to, right? There are a lot of meetings that are easy, a lot of relationships that are strong um, and it we have a, a it's getting a little bit bigger, but we have a fairly small team. But when you have meetings that you feel like we're putting so much time into the conflict between the people here that the student is suffering, right? We we're, we're don't have anything left um, to, to go to the student. So when we're spending a lot of time in these meetings or we're having more than one meeting and we still feel like we're not getting anywhere, those are good times to ask for a facilitated IEP. I'd say any time that somebody feels like they are being shut down, not heard, not valued within a meeting, having a facilitated IEP can help reset that, can help kind of set the stage. Um, and again, what we hope is that after we have a meeting with the group, that when we leave and you have your next meeting, maybe without a facilitator, that some of those good practices continue on. Um, and, and I think they do for the most part. Um, when you've got a, a student that, boy, the situation's really confusing, complex, a lot of different disabilities or a lot of maybe some medical complications or things that we're, we're having to involve a lot of people and a lot of data. Um, sometimes it can help just having somebody else come in to manage the process. And again, leave everybody else who's there at the table to focus on the content and the student. Um, when we need better understanding of the situation, or when we get off track a lot, when we're not following the IEP process, those are good times to think about having a facilitator come in. Or sometimes it's just this one issue that we can't seem to get past. Um, now you can address these same kinds of things in mediation um, or at a resolution hearing, or you, know, you can do those kinds of things. The difference is that this, again, it's, it's somebody who's neutral, which those, those folks are as well. You're also doing it within the regular case conference process. So a lot of times when you go to mediation, 
you've got a few school people and you've got parents and they're separating you when they're talking to you, trying to get this agreement. I, I think we need to be together when we're, when we're coming to resolution because we learn from the process of getting there. Um, just a little bit about some things that are happening in other states. So like I said, this is not part of Indiana law. There, um, at one point, there was kind of some conversation and I think some bill proposals that would have brought um, facilitated IEP into our law. Um, and then COVID hit and lots of things got dropped and, and just they didn't become a, a priority anymore. So I don't know if that'll ever come into play or not, but it's still used um, very well in the state. Um, and I, across the nation, we've got more and more people who are using this kind of a process. Um, over half of the states have some sort of facilitated IEP process that they offer. Um, and then we do have some states that it is part of code. It is part of um, before you file for due process, you need to try this first. And, and I would encourage that, I really would. Um, I think that the more that we can try these more informal things, the better your, your um, relationship is after the fact. Then again, when you go to due process and if it's needed, absolutely. Those are part of, of parent rights. But when something else, a little less costly, painful, time consuming um, could be used to potentially salvage that relationship that's gonna be going on for a number of years um, and try to address and, and make progress on those different issues, why not use that? At least give it a try first. So here is how the process works. And it's a little bit different for those of you who might have um, used this process in the past. Um, there's kind of an extra step. And that extra step is to first complete a JOT form, which is kind of an online form that you fill out. And it's at this link. And I think um, Jill and Lisa will probably share this PowerPoint with you guys afterwards, but um, it is a request that goes to the Department of Education. And the Department of Education is just making sure that they, they know, you know, how is this being used around the state? they send that request on to my office. And then when we get that request, um, then we assign a facilitator, but we have to have a second step, which is to complete an actual uh, form. And um, you can print that from our website. There's an FIEP tab that you can find all of these, the link and the, the form but it has to have some information, just some general information about the student, grade level, building, that kind of thing, plus contacts for the administrator, um, for the teacher of record, and contacts for the parent. Then parent and school have to sign that. If we don't have signatures from both, then we can't move forward at all with that. Um, and then that form just gets returned to our office and, and there are options for mailing it, faxing it, or sending that through email if you scan it. So when we get all this stuff together, or honestly, if we get one piece of it, then we reach out to figure out, are we getting the other piece? Are we getting the form, the job form request, that kind of thing. Um, and our intake coordinator is Gail Ringwalt. And Gail, um, will either, um, Gail will assign this out to somebody who is available. Um, and then we make contact with both the parent and the school most of the time. So it, it kind of happens a little bit. We sometimes follow this to a T depending on how much information that we uh, need if we're missing a form or something like that. But most of the time, by the time it gets to me to facilitate, I know that all the forms have been signed and I have all the information that I need. And I usually send out an email to the school and to the parent jointly because I want everybody to see what I'm sending everybody else. And it's the same information that basically says, here's what an FIEP is, here's what to expect, 
Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. But if not, don't tell me anything. I really don't want to know um, very much information. And then when I come to a case conference, again, I chart things, I have my tools, and that all goes away with me unless we have to have a continuation to a meeting. And then I keep the charts so that everybody can feel confident that nobody's adding to them or subtracting from them. And then I bring them back um, and just start from there for the next meeting. Now we do always encourage uh, anybody who attends if they would like to snap photos of the, the charts that have been written so that they've got something um, to cue their memory when they're cleaning up an IEP or when they're trying to make sure that the information um, gets where it needs to go, then certainly they can do that too. So the school is gonna set up the meeting just like they always would. The school is going to be in charge of writing the IEP and typing into the system just like they always would. The difference is that as we move through the process, I would be asking questions. I would be charting. I might be getting some clarification. Uh, you know, I might be asking for our group to take a break or, um, you know, to, to try some different tools along the way, those kinds of things. So a couple of things to know. Number one, the service is absolutely free um, and anybody can request it. So I would say it's probably 50-50 of um, percentage of requests that are initiated by the school versus initiated by the parent. Um, they tend to take a little longer than usual because there's a little extra setup, but when you take a little bit longer to have a really good meeting as opposed to having you know three four short meetings that got nowhere then it it actually can can be a time saver in the end lisa i just want to check in with you make sure we don't have any questions so far no we do not yet dr mckinney and this has been very helpful in explaining the process good 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 okay so a couple of things um things that we have learned <laughs> good and bad so oh here here's the answer we have been doing this for for about eight years um, as far as providing facilitators across the state and every year we see the numbers growing um, and our team grows a little bit too, just to meet that demand. Um, we have seen so much success with meetings. Um, when, when one side or the other makes that request, we see success. When a complaint has been resolved, and this is part of the next meeting after a complaint, we usually see success there and after mediation. Now, where we have not seen a whole lot of success is when we have been ordered as part of um, a due process or when a due process has happened and that is being appealed. I, I quite honestly, I think those meetings are a hot mess because there, there are some hidden agendas there that are kind of out of the control of both sides, really. Um, you know, especially when we are appealing a situation, when either party is appealing a previous due process uh, ruling, then I think it, it kind of is a, a hidden agenda of we'd like for certain things to come out in conversation that will benefit our side, right? And I, I just think it, it tends to be um, harder in those situations. Um, what I've also found is that in-person meetings are best. Virtual meetings can still work with a facilitated IEP meeting um, and having somebody there um, on the virtual meeting. What I think is really difficult is when we have a hybrid. Um, for example, I've been part of quite a few meetings where several people were on a Zoom or a Google Meet or something like that. And then there was a room full of people with the one computer and camera and microphone that you couldn't hear everyone and couldn't see everyone well um, in a, another room. 
when, when things are set up like that, they just don't work as well. Because part of what I rely on as a facilitator is I need faces. I need to look at body language and facial expressions. And so you can see most of my, my you can see my facial expressions really well on this camera, but um, a little bit with body language, not as much. But when we have meetings and someone refuses to turn on their camera, and sometimes they quite honestly have good reason for it, sometimes they don't, um, but when I can't see everyone, when I can't tell who's talking because the, the camera is not on them and they're in a different room, um, or I can't hear them clearly, it really interferes with being able to, um, to make sure that everyone's getting heard, make sure that the questions are answered and asked, um, all of those kinds of things. And just to be able to read people. You know, I always tell people as we're going over the ground rules, you know, ask questions if you have them. But I tell them, if you look like you have a question, I'm probably going to ask you, do you have a question? <laughs> because I, I have questions all the time that I'm thinking, should I ask? Should I not? I'm not sure. Am I going to sound like I, you know, is, is it going to be a silly question? So but I think by setting that up in the beginning and saying, you know, if you kind of have that look on your face, either I'm going to say, do you have a question? Or I'm going to try to anticipate what that question is and ask it from my perspective. And sometimes things come up where we slip into educational lingo. Like you might hear, well, your child's RIT score on the NWEA was a 218. I, in most cases, I'm going to have a somewhat of an understanding what that means because I'm a school psychologist, right? But not everybody around that table is going to. So if I see that look on, on a parent's face, on a, um, you know, a, maybe a speech pathologist's face, somebody who might not know what those things are, say, now, can you clarify, what is NWA, first of all? What is a RIT score? And is 218 good, bad? in the middle, you know, tell me that. So if I can ask those questions for them, then I will do that as well. But what I can't do is see that when we have those hybrid meetings. So I, I mean, I would encourage you just when, when meetings are being set up to say, you know, I'd like it this way or this way, but not the, the mixing of the two, if, if at all possible. Now, obviously we need to get all the bodies there too. And, and I would much rather have a, um, uh, kind of mishmashed hybrid meeting then not have the right people involved and not be able to meet at all. So take it or leave it, you know. Um, okay, so some other things that we've kind of learned are some of those meetings are actually shorter and, and easy. I sometimes walked out of facilitated IEP meetings and thought, I did nothing but get it started because this team was phenomenal. But those are usually the meetings where somebody lets me know later, this is not how it usually goes, right? They did the work and sometimes behaviors change because of facilitators in that room or behaviors change because everyone is wanting to do things right. Um, and that's okay too, as long as they it, things are good, that's what I'm looking for. Um, again, some meetings last a little bit longer, but hopefully are effective and they tend to be effective more than not. And then there is some nightmare meetings. I mean, I've had some seven session meetings that just took up an enormous amount of time. And I, I try to reflect back every time that we have a meeting that is somewhat negative and think, what can I do differently? And I make changes, um, but there are also some times where um, I'm not sure if I could have done anything differently, it, it's, it would have still been an issue. So some tips um, that I would suggest for um, liaisons, again, stay in your same role, support the parent, um, support the parent emotionally, support them with um, the knowledge that you have um, and the experiences that you've had. I, all of those things are still important. We absolutely love to have our parent liaisons there. Um, 
Also make sure that you are supporting to any of the parents that you work with that we are not there as an advocate for the, uh, for the student, as an advocate for the parent, as an advocate for um, the school. We are strictly there for the process and um, we're trying to remain neutral on things. So because I'm trying to be a neutral person, if you all see an issue with the IEP, if you think the goal, goals are not good, if you think that service is not appropriate, bring it up because I can't. I, I want to make sure, and then sometimes I'm just hoping and praying that, that somebody else is going to bring it up because um, it's important, and I think it would make for a better IEP if we made some changes. But again, I have to stay out of that, so please bring it up. Don't think that because I didn't say something, it was good, because that's not necessarily true. And then definitely don't be afraid to jump in and ask for some clarification uh, regarding any legal issues that, that come up as well. Ask for a break if you need it. If you need to, I mean, I really try to enforce that no side conversations um, ground rule, but there are some times where you might need to have a private conversation. It's okay to ask for a break. A couple of minutes spent in a break are so much better than, than getting off track during a meeting or um, feeling like you can't address something that you needed to address before we move on to the next step. Um, really stick to only talking about this student. So for those of you who work for InSource, you're coming from a unique background. You're coming from that background of you've got experience, personal experience of supporting a student with a disability. And um, I, I think it's important to use that experience, but not to ever say things like, well, with my child or back in an IEP meeting that I had, just really keeping it focused on this particular student so that we're not um, kind of crossing those lines of um, confidentiality or anything like that. And then always promoting the notion that Everybody who's sitting around this table should be a team, and they're a team for the student. They are a team that is going to potentially change the course of this student's life, and they are so incredibly important. All right, so I know it's only been about an hour, and I've got um, maybe another slide, but I really want to um, just ask for some questions or even some input. If you've experienced a facilitated IEP and, and want to share a success or maybe something that you were concerned about, as long as we're not sharing information about a student or anything confidential, then I would love to hear some of these because it may be helpful um, from a different lens of what does this look like? Because I'm just coming at it from the facilitator's point of view. Everyone, this is a great opportunity to ask Dr. McKinney any questions or thoughts. We at InSource often will have the discussion with parents about what an FIEP is. We will send the link from the IEP Technical Assistance Center website so they can read about it. They see the videos, they find out about the process. And many times part of what we, we discuss is um, when maybe a family has contacted us and they've had many case conferences and they just do not feel that um, it's going the way they'd like. Or perhaps they feel that they are just on opposite ends of discussions. And we will go over their dispute process but we also really encourage them to consider the FIEP. And so that is one of the things. So it's a great opportunity to ask questions. And Jill, I don't know if you have questions on Facebook Live or not, or if you have anything additional to-, to and, uh, Kelly has her hand raised. Um, Kelly, you will have to put your um, question in the question and answer box or in the um, chat box. Um, due to just how we have the um, setup for today. Okay. Um, Lisa, I have no questions that have been posted on Facebook Live, but I do, I do have a question um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure you answered it, but you know, whenever we go and um, 
when we talk to parents a lot of times, we will ask them, you know, how long have you asked for the meeting is, you know, um, because they know that, you know, an hour, did you get an hour? What, what time frame are we looking at? And I know with the, with the facilitated, um, it does take a little bit longer. Is there an estimated time that we can tell like parents, oh, you know, um, it might last two hours, might last five, you know? <laughs> um, so is there some sort of an estimation? Because that's one of the questions that I've been asked before. So I, what I definitely um, try to address is when I get an invitation to a meeting and it says we're meeting from nine to 10, I call right away and say, let's rethink that. How about, is there any way to have a little bit longer block of time? I like to block out a two hour block and that usually covers most meetings. Definitely not all, but one of our, our ground rules is to honor time limits. That's one I couldn't think of. And so we have that discussion right from the beginning. What is the time that all of our required members can be here? Because if somebody has to leave at 90 minutes and they don't have a written excusal ahead of time, then that's when we're stopping. You know, we're, I'm not taking a meeting beyond that time um, without having a parent um, who has given the permission for that person to leave. Um, I, I sometimes go to meetings, though, where we're starting at 8 o'clock in the morning and people will say, well, you know, 12 o'clock would have to be our drop dead time. And if that's the case and we're getting near 12 o'clock, I'm checking in with people. Okay, we're getting close to 12 o'clock. Do you think we can wrap this up? Or do you think um, we're going to need to table this meeting at some point and pick up on another date? And we have many meetings that get continued because I would much rather continue a meeting and get good quality than try to just cram a bunch of stuff in at the end and get it wrapped up. Um, even if it's a short virtual meeting later to tie up all the rest of the loose ends, those loose ends are important. Every piece of the IEP is important. Absolutely. And one of the things too, that I, I just really want to comment on, if you've never been in the process or seen the process, it's, it's just really amazing because um, as I tell parents, your voice is heard. And, you know, because a lot of times that's another thing that parents will say, you know, I don't feel like they're listening to me in a facilitated boy, I'm telling you what they are heard. And I really appreciate that. And I think that's where a lot of times I also hear, you know, parents saying, you know, um, that was the best meeting I ever had because, you know, that's the way it was. And, you know, so I greatly appreciate all the hard work that you and your team do do. Thank you. And, and yeah. I think. I just want to make sure that everyone understands too. I think a lot of parents feel very, and other staff members, there's some other staff members who feel like maybe my administrator is doing all the talking and my voice is not heard. Um, but heard and agreed with may be different. So I, I think it can be frustrating when you go through a process and you're like, but I still didn't get what I was looking for. And, and that's that can happen too, because... Um, you know, schools have to always consider parent input doesn't mean that they always agree with what a parent is asking. But I, I think the most important thing for me as a parent is if somebody is telling me you can't have that, they, they back it up with why. The data is not heading in that direction. We think your child could do um, better using this or better in this placement. Um, but I wanted a why, not because it's more convenient and it fits in the, the existing schedule. There has to be a good reason for it. And so teasing some of that out during the conversation, I think, is another thing that a facilitator can help with as well. We do have a question and a comment. Um, so the question is, do you find that requesting an FIEP that the case conference committee will be defensive and start off on the wrong foot? Do you ever feel that's negative from the get-go? Uh, I wouldn't say never, but mostly no. Um, I, I can think of one time where a parent had requested a facilitator for a meeting for an initial and um, 
And the school got a little defensive in the sense that they're like, wait, we have any, we have no bad blood, right? We, we've, we want to take a crack at this first. And, and because the school didn't want to agree to it yet, that's okay. And I think the meeting must have gone well because we never got contacted again. Um, and they knew that it was an option for later if, if things didn't go well. I would say there may be a little defensiveness occasionally, but most of the time that goes away when the meeting actually starts because they see that it's, it's not like bringing in someone on behalf of the parent or on behalf of the student. When they really have a good understanding that this is a neutral person to help you out, then usually it makes the meetings much easier. Thank you. And we also had a comment that someone didn't have a question, but they have really heard great feedback from both schools and families about facilitated meetings. Um, and then we did have another question. Once the facilitated meeting is requested, how soon do you typically have someone available to hold the meeting? Well, we love to have two weeks notice we don't always get it. Um, we got a request a couple of days ago for a meeting on Wednesday and we have a facilitator going. So, I mean, we do our best to get someone there and our team has gotten a little bit deeper too, which makes it uh, a little easier for us to make sure that we have someone. Um, there may be some key times of the year where we just get tons and tons of referrals for this, and it might be a little harder, but um, I would say most of the time, if, if you know within a week, a week to two weeks, we can usually get somebody there. I don't know if we've had to turn down more than, I think, one over the course of, you know, eight years. Wow, that is wonderful. Jill, did you have any questions from Facebook Live? No, I don't. But Angie, you, brought, uh, Dr. McKinney, excuse me, you brought something up about um, why would you not be able to do a facilitated? Is there is there any guidelines on why you wouldn't be able to do one? No, quite honestly, um, even even those situations that I spoke about, like coming out of due process, if if it's ordered, I'm going to do it, right? Because. It, Nobody wants to get in trouble, right? After they've had a, a hearing report that comes out that says you will do this, then you know I want to make sure that that can happen. Um, so we don't really, because we don't ask for a lot of content coming into it. Um, there are no situations that we've said no. We're steering clear of this one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have, the only time that we've turned one down, it was because we simply did not have anyone available and the meeting had to be held because of a timeline or a manifestation determination timeline or something like that. And they had to go ahead with the meeting without us. Okay. I don't have anything that's been posted on Facebook Live. Okay, I wanna share just uh, one more slide if I can get my computer to cooperate here. Um, if you scan this link, it will take you to our remaining uh, workshops for the fall semester. And um, we offer these to anyone within the schools on a variety of different topics, but they are certainly open to anyone outside of the schools as well. And so we do, we have trainings and these are all free, um, but we have trainings on things like writing measurable goals. Um, functional behavioral assessments and behavior plans. We have lots of trainings for what administrators need to know about special education, but know that those are open to any of you as well. If you just want some additional information, you can also uh, always go to our website and much like the, the things that are on the in-source um, YouTube channel, we have a YouTube channel as well. So if you go to our website and click on our YouTube channel, we have lots of recorded trainings and webinars too that are available at any time. So if you want to know what school folks are being taught to do, at least from, from our perspective, then you can always tap into those resources as well. And then I'll put my contact information up here too. So you're always welcome to follow up with any questions that might come up and I will address those as best I can.
And I may I, refer you right back to InSource to, <laughs> to get some additional information. I have put in the webinar chat box, the um, website for the IEPTA.org. And I also have put it in our Facebook live um, chat box as well for anyone that would like that information. Now is a great time to ask those questions. Um, why we have Dr. McKinney here. I do want to thank you, Dr. McKinney, for presenting for us today. This is a this is a subject that um, really it's it's very timely. We are at the beginning of the school year. Um, we know that um, at the beginning of the school year, there's always a lot of case conferences. We know um, historically we have them in the spring and towards the end of the school year. So thank you for you know getting this information out for us and um, our audience. Lisa, do you have any other questions? I do not have any other questions. I do also want to thank you, Dr. McKinney, and thank you for everyone attending. An FIEP is an excellent choice to consider. Uh, even if you just feel the situation is a bit too emotional um, and you really want to help have someone help you sort through things. And again, as Dr. McKinney said, they're not there to make decisions, but they will also pull in and and have the considerations of Article 7, so that can be a discussion point. So I don't have anything else at this point, Jill or Dr. McKinney, and I am so appreciative to have you come and speak to us today. Anytime. And, and I, I do say any subject, but not any subject. <laughs> I've got some things that I know a little bit about, but lots of, that I don't. <laughs> we do have a comment on Facebook Live. Uh, great info. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to let everyone know that, um, again, we will be back with a webinar on September the 7th, and that will be our family to family webinar, and they will be here to present. Also, on the 21st of September, we're going to have a discussion on the McKinney-Vento law. Easy for me to say, right? <laughs> um, but as of right now, I don't see any more questions. Lisa? I don't, but I do have one comment. You'll notice on our webinars that we we um, follow kind of two tracks. One, organizations that you might want to reach out to. So we try to um, have different organizations like Family to Family um, or the ARC of Indiana or even First Steps come on at different times so that you could share the video, you could attend, you could find out about their services. And then the second path has to do with like today about presentations. And um, in June, the IEP Technical Assistance Center talked about IEPs and evaluations. And um, so we've also on our YouTube channel, we have bullying and youth uh, suicide. We have a variety of different topics. So you'll see there are two different paths that we're trying to cover on our webinars. Um, so please tell others about it, share the information, and thank you for participating. And Jill just put up our QR code in case you hadn't had an opportunity to, to scan that. Please do. We are state and federally funded, uh, and we want to ensure that we are getting information out to um, community stakeholders, parents, anyone who would like to take part in our information. And remember to visit our website at insource.org. And Lisa, I want to uh, let you know that there's been a comment on here for you on Facebook Live. It says, I want to thank Lisa as well. She was very helpful when I had an issue with my grandson. So thank, thank you, you both very much for today. Please, um, if you would fill out that training, sign in that training survey, and then you'll be able to per, you'll print off one of your certificates for um, being here today. Again, Dr. McKinney, thank you so much for being here. Lisa, as always, thanks for being my co-host and, <laughs> thank you, and the person thank you. that really keeps me on track. <laughs> so um, if there's no other questions or comments at this time, I will be ending our webinar for today and we'll see everyone on September the 7th. Thank you.